Thank you all for joining so pro promptly. We are going to start at 940 to give everyone else time to join and our speaker time to prepare. Please feel free to grab a cup of coffee or your breakfast while we wait. We will begin shortly. Thanks again. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're gonna be starting in a few minutes.
Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Chelsea Bornoff, and with me is Claire Scavoni, and we are this year's co-conference chairs for the EPIC conference. EPIC, for those of you who may not know, stands for Emory Public Interest Committee. We are a student-run organization out of the law school, and we help connect students to public interest events and opportunities. We also raise money to provide grants to Emory Law students who secure unpaid public internship, public interest internships over the summer. And of course, EPIC hosts a conference like this one every year. This is our first ever virtual conference and may very well be our only virtual conference. We are really excited about the topic and the speakers we have presenting today. As I'm sure you're all aware by now, this year's conference is on the topic of voting rights. And we have a very amazing line of, we have an amazing lineup of speakers that I'm sure we are all anxious to hear from. So I'll pass this on to Claire who will go over some housekeeping items before we get started. Thanks, Chelsea. Once again, thank you all for joining us via Zoom. We hope the technology will cooperate, but here are a few tips in case it does not. If for any reason you are booted out of the webinar, please try to rejoin using the same link. If there is an issue for all attendees, we will send out an email letting you all know and we will relaunch the session immediately. Again, we do not anticipate these problems, but your go-to strategy should be to try to rejoin. We welcome and encourage you all to submit questions to our amazing speakers. At the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A button. Please type your questions there. They will be sent to Chelsea and I, and we will pass them along to the speakers at the end. As a reminder, each session has a separate link. At the end of each session, we will let you know that it is time to proceed to the next link. We will put the link in the Zoom chat, but you can also find it in any email you have received from us. To receive EPIC conference credit or CLE credit, you must attend all three sessions in their entirety. Chelsea and I will aim to launch each webinar link right at the designated time. If you join before we launch the link, you may receive a message that says waiting for hosts to start meeting. Please stay on this page and you will be automatically admitted as soon as we launch the webinar. If there is a major delay in the schedule, you will receive an email to that effect. Again, if you are booted from a session, please rejoin. Attendees may rejoin at any time throughout the session. Thank you again for joining us this morning. We are delighted to introduce the Dean of Emory University School of Law to welcome all of you to this year's conference. Dean Marianne Babinski joined Emory just over a year ago and it has been evident from the start how supportive she is of public interest and of EPIC. Dean Babinski, thank you for joining us this morning. We're gonna turn it over to you. Well, good morning uh, and welcome to everyone to uh, the Emory Public Interest Committee's annual conference. Um, thank you for that uh, nice introduction. Um, as you heard, I'm Marianne Babinski, the Dean of the Law School, and it's my pleasure to open what promises to be a really important and interesting uh, conference. This year's topic, 100 Years and Counting, the ongoing fight for voting rights, is, we all know, particularly timely. Uh, with a presidential election just 31 days away, early voting already underway in many places, and of course, all this happening in the midst of a global pandemic. The right to vote is critical to our democracy, and yet, as we know, uh, securing and protecting that right has not always been um, a focus and has not always been successful. Um, this year marks the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which uh, is popularly known for giving women the right to vote. Uh, African Americans were routinely denied access to the right to vote until the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, and as we see in news articles and um, across social media, uh, there continue to be challenges to voting uh, today. So there could not be a more timely and important conference and I commend EPIC uh, for selecting this year's topic and for securing uh, such amazing speakers. And uh, thank you for your willingness uh, to attend and participate in this conference. In my 14 months as Dean at Emory, I've been impressed uh, with the breadth and depth of our students' uh, activism and commitment uh, to public service and public interest. Uh, and EPIC has been a key factor, uh, key organizing, uh, energizing, an inspiring group uh, in this effort. Uh, the EPIC students' passion and commitment to serve others and to make a positive difference in society reflect the kind of professionalism and commitment to public service that we hope that all lawyers and all Emory Law graduates uh, will inspire to through the course of their careers. So I applaud EPIC uh, and am delighted to affirm uh, my strong support for all of their activities, including particularly uh, this conference. And I'd like to recognize the EPIC conference co-chairs, Claire Scavini and Chelsea Vornoff, uh, who you've just uh, met, 
both second year students uh, for organizing this program. I'm sure you would recognize that organizing a conference in the midst of a pandemic uh, can be challenging, uh, but they've been uh, creative uh, and um, you know, committed to achieving the very best with this conference, as you can see from the program and the speakers that are being presented to you. Uh, so they've met the challenges and went above and beyond to ensure a successful conference. So uh, to all of you, I uh, hope you enjoy today's conference and uh, I hope you'll cast your vote on November 3rd, if not before, uh, and uh, wanted to invite you to enjoy what's going to be uh, an amazing event today. I now want to recognize EPIC's president for this year, Drew Selden, uh, who's going to be introducing the keynote speaker. Drew. Thank you, Dean Babinski. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. First and foremost, thank you to our conference co-chairs, Claire and Chelsea. Just to echo what Dean Babinski said, um, they've really tackled COVID challenges head on and have planned such a wonderful conference. I've been really grateful to them for all their hard work uh, and their creativity, and I'm excited for a day of learning. I have the privilege of introducing our first speaker, Sean Young. Mr. Young is the legal director of the ACLU of Georgia and has extensive experience litigating voting right cases. Today, he will provide insight into the history of voting rights and current efforts to defend them. With that being said, I'd like to pass the virtual mic to Mr. Young. All right, thank you for having me here today. Um, welcome to this conference, and it's a real honor to be able to kick it off uh, with a keynote speaker. Um, like the uh, folks said, I'm going to be talking about a brief overview of the history of voting rights and try to make and try to talk about how voting rights lawyers have litigated and filed lawsuits in response to the different waves of voter suppression that have occurred throughout history. Then I'm going to try to make it a little bit more relevant to today to talk a little bit about the litigation that's happening um, in this election season and then end with a few words about what do we do from here. Uh, so first, let's start with a brief overview of the history of voting rights in this country. And I'm going to skip and jump to the 15th Amendment. As most folks know, after the Civil War, the Constitution was amended to add the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. The 15th Amendment says that the government cannot deny or abridge the right to vote on account of uh, someone's race or their previous condition of servitude. So what it plainly did was forbid states from saying only white people can vote. Pretty straightforward. And so after that happened, um, needless to say racism did not end. And so governments started to try to figure out how can we still disenfranchise black people without violating the letter of the 15th Amendment, without saying explicitly black people cannot vote. And I frame the history in that way because that is one way I wanna encourage folks to think about voter suppression, particularly voter suppression against people of color. I'm gonna talk about three, I'm gonna artificially talk about three different waves of voter suppression in our history. Now the waves, like the waves of an ocean, they overlap. But I think this is the best way to kind of think about it. So wave number one is what I'm going to call vote denial 1.0. The term vote denial is a kind of legal term of art that voting rights lawyers use to refer to barriers that make it harder for someone to cast a ballot. Simple as that. So from about 1865 to about 1965, and again, these dates are very, a little bit artificial because there's a lot of overlap. Excuse me. Um, we saw um, some pretty hefty voting, voting barriers that were designed to prevent black from voting. We had literacy tests, which is actually a misnomer. Um, literacy tests weren't a test to see if someone could read, but was really a series of impossible to answer questions. And rather than applying those questions even handedly, because one would think if the questions were so hard, both white and black voters would fail them. It was applied deliberately to disenfranchise black people. 
So if a white voter couldn't answer the question, they would still say you pass. But a black person who couldn't answer questions, they would be disenfranchised. The sec the, another barrier was poll taxes. They would require people to show up to the polls and uh, spend money to vote. In Virginia in particular, poll taxes were passed in around 1900, uh, deliberately designed to prevent black people from voting. Their reasoning was, oh, you know, well, we need to somehow cover the costs of running an election because there are costs. So why don't we simply charge voters uh, some money for the privilege of voting? Um, you would think, again, that this kind of reasoning could have applied before the Civil War, but it was enacted after the Civil War to disenfranchise Black people. And then, of course, we have felon disenfranchisement, which is provisions that uh, exclude categorically anyone who has been previously convicted of a felony. The reason is someone who has committed, uh, com committed a felony has somehow violated the social contract with the state, so it does not deserve to vote. Again, um, this reasoning could have applied before the Civil War, but the wave of felon voter uh, disenfranchisement laws did not really come until after the Civil War. Uh, when they, and what they would do is they would arbitrarily arrest and convict black people of committing felonies and then they wouldn't be able to vote. How did, what did litigation look like in this era? Um, some people may be surprised to hear that, or, or maybe not surprised to hear, that litigation challenging these measures uh, before the Supreme Court weren't always successful. Um, there definitely were Supreme Court decisions that were quite bold at the time that said, look, these barriers are facially neutral. They don't say only black people have to do them, but come on, we all know why they were passed. This is obvious racial discrimination. Some Supreme Court decisions actually didn't say that. They said a literacy test is a literacy test. It's neutral. And so it doesn't violate the 15th Amendment. So, but by the time we got to the 1950s, 1960s, I think there was general awareness that obviously these things were designed to be discriminatory. So, in 1965, what happens after the march in Selma and the hard work of Martin Luther King and other activists, Lyndon Johnson signed into law the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And soon after, the 24th Amendment was passed to explicitly ban poll taxes for federal elections. What did the Voting Rights Act of 1965 do? Well, it explicitly banned literacy tests and poll taxes for federal elections, plain and simple as that. Um, it did not address felon disenfranchisement, which persists to this day, however. So that can be put to the side. But it also created a, a, a provision called preclearance. The way I like to describe preclearance is this. Basically, it looked at states and other jurisdictions that had a pernicious history of voting discrimination. Those places were basically put on probation. And those places were, were the law was you cannot enact any changes to the voting laws or voting procedures without first getting sign off from the US Justice Department or a court. And to get sign off, you have to prove that what you're doing does not discriminate against black people that doesn't like turn back the clock and make it harder for black people to vote. And this preclearance provision was vitally important. It withstood constitutional challenges early on and um, it was critical as the Supreme Court even recently uh, recognized at increasing black voter registration. Um, as some of us know that provision was effectively gutted more recently but I'll get to that. So that's wave one. Wave two is what I call vote dilution. Wave two really, it's really throughout history, but I'll just kind of artificially say, really um, covers from 1965 to the present day. And I'm gonna call this, I mean, it's not my term, but I'm gonna call it vote dilution. So what's vote dilution? Vote denial makes it harder for people to vote. Vote dilution on the other hand says, you know, everyone can vote. Everyone votes, we're all good, everyone votes on equal terms. But after they vote, we're gonna dilute those votes by drawing district lines in such a way so that black voters' votes simply do not matter in that black communities will not be able to elect candidates of their choice. 
So even if all black people can vote, they just won't be able to elect the candidates that they want. Um, how, what is like a classic example of this? The classic example, which still happens to this day, is the creation of at-large districts. So most people kind of are familiar with the way city council elections generally work, which is a city is divided into, I'll just say five districts. And each district votes for a city council representative and then they get to the city council. So let's imagine there's a city with five districts, we call them single member districts. Um, the city is 75% white, 25% black. But if you look at one of the districts, the black community covers a majority of that district. So they get to elect a candidate of their choice. So now the city council says, you know what, we don't like it that black people get to vote for even one city council member, or get to pick a city council member. So we're gonna eliminate the districts and create at-large districts. At-large districts basically cover the entire city and whoever gets a majority of the vote wins. So we're gonna say all five city council members are now elected at large. Because black people constitute an overall minority, all five city council members will be elected by the white majority. So that's a classic example how, of how vote dilution works. This happened even, again, this happens to this day. In around 2012, Sumter County, which is the birthplace of Jimmy Carter, um, had a board of, of education, which had been dominated by majority white uh, folks throughout history. Uh, and uh, even though the children who went to Sumter County public schools were predominantly in uh, 2012, black candidates were poised to win a majority of the Sumter County Board of Education for the very first time in history. And what happened? They created at-large seats, preventing them from getting that majority. So what did we do about that? Well, the Voting Rights Act, a lot of um, some Supreme Court cases which looked at vote dilution just you know, looked at the Voting Rights Act and said, well, you know, this, you know, Voting Rights Act really is for like vote denial, putting barriers. Here, there are no barriers. They're just redrawing the lines and states can redraw lines. No Voting Rights Act violation. So in 1982, they amended the Voting Rights Act um, to, and they amended particularly Section 2, which prevents discriminatory voting barriers, but they amended to also prevent the kind of vote dilution that we're talking about. Litigation on vote dilution and vote dilution situations uh, still occur to this day with mixed success. The third wave is around the 2000s to the present, and I'm gonna call this vote denial 2.0. Um, these measures are a little more subtle and or not so subtle, and they include voter ID requirements, voter registration barriers, cutbacks to early voting, all sorts of things that continue to make it harder disproportionately for black people to vote. Why did wave three come uh, out of nowhere? Um, well, all I will note is that in 2008, there was record-breaking black turnout to elect this country's first black president. And suddenly, wave three came along. So I think this is a very important fact to note, leading a lot of people to question why wave three uh, happened, and I'll leave y'all to figure that out. In 2013, we had the Shelby County decision from the Supreme Court that essentially gutted that pre-clearance provision from the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So now states like Georgia with a history of voting rights discrimination can pass whatever restrictions they want without having to get signed off. And the only way those things can be struck down is if litigants like um, the ACLU challenge them um, in court, and they are the ones that have the burden of proving that they are discriminatory. So what's, the, what's a good way of thinking about the state of litigation today? Um, there are a lot of different voting rights claims, but I'm just gonna give a quick overview of the kind of two claims that you should keep in mind when you think about voting rights litigation. The first claim is called the Anderson Burdick Test. Now, I'm not going to get into um, a lot of length as to the history of it, how the test was created, but it's based on two cases called Anderson and Burdick. And um, 
this test has, has been analogized actually to the abortion um, jurisprudence. Basically, it's a sliding scale. The stronger, the, bur the, the heavier the burden that a voting restriction places on voters, the heavier, um, the stronger the government justification for imposing the barriers must be. So many different courts have ruled that states can pass um, voter ID laws, even if they discriminate against black, even if they have a disproportionate impact on black people, because the government has an important interest in preventing voter fraud. Um, section two of the Voting Rights Act looks at whether voting barrier is discriminatory. And it's, you have to show a disparate impact and a variety of factors that show that um, the historical, um, the history of discrimination, of racial discrimination, combines with this voter barrier to make it harder for African Americans to vote. Again, in the voter ID examples, Black people are less likely to have IDs. Why are they less likely to have IDs? Because they tend to be poor, they tend to have lower incomes. Why do they tend to have lower incomes? Because of the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow. That's how you demonstrate a Section 2 violation. Um, so, what are some of the challenges that we face in this kind of litigation? First of all, and, and this is the challenges that voting rights activists face today. First of all, how do we measure burdens on voters? The, um, the problem is, so when, when we bring voting rights litigation, typically speaking, um, the lawsuits aren't really about middle class voters like me and you or wealthy voters who generally have an easy time voting, although that's not necessarily true these days, um, given long lines and other uh, problems with the postal service, but just at a very high level. And a lot of judges um, view burdens from the perspective of a middle class person. Why can't people just get an ID? Why can't they just go to the DMV, get their birth certificate, you know, buy the birth certificate from their hometown and just get an ID. I mean, I have an ID, you have an ID. We need IDs to um, get on flights. We need IDs to book hotels. What's the big deal? Um, well, the big deal, obviously, is that lower income voters, who are the very voters that we should be centering when we fight for voting rights, they don't fly on planes. They don't book into hotels. They don't need IDs to, they don't drive, they don't have cars. For them, it is a real barrier. Um, so that's the first challenge. The second challenge is that um, a lot of these recent voting barriers, Vote Denial 2.0, like Vote Denial 1.1, 1.0, have um, purported justifications that would make sense to an alien if they just landed on Earth. So for example, voter ID, photo identification, they'll say, well, uh, we need to make sure that the voter uh, who shows up the polls is who they say they are. So that's why we require photo ID. Seems to make sense. Um, the problem is there's no evidence that there is widespread voter impersonation. There's no evidence that a lot of people, oh, for instance, are you know, wearing fake mustaches when they go into the polling places. Um, but courts don't have generally not cared about that. They've said, you know, we don't care if there's evidence or not. Um, state has an interest in doing that, so they get to do it. And that strength, the strength of that interest outweighs whatever burdens um, that it might impose on people, like making them go to the DMV. That's kind of a really big challenge that we face in these cases. Um, and courts also don't really scrutinize, um, you know, and this is, I guess, the next challenge, even um, weighing the government's justifications as much, much as we do, they're not looking at how are they carrying out those justifications. Now, some courts have, but I'm just speaking at a very high level. So for example, we want to verify that a voter is who they say they are, so we're going to require photo ID. But you know, let's, let's decide um, what, what IDs count as photo IDs, because there are a lot of photo IDs. So this is what North Carolina did, so we're going to, create a chart, here are the IDs that work, and here are the IDs that don't. Um, what are the IDs that work? Okay, driver's licenses, um, uh, gun permit, um, you know, college student IDs, 
um, veterans IDs, oh, US passports. What are the IDs that don't, don't work? Mm, you know, tribal IDs, tribal photo IDs, they, they look kind of sketchy. Um, technical college IDs, I mean, they're not like college IDs, they're just technical college. These are real life examples, by the way. Library cards, you know, employee IDs, like, you know, if you were, if you're a janitor at a government building, you have photo ID, eh, you know, that's kind of sketchy. So you see, because they exclude these forms of ID, it really calls to question the real reason why they're passing these laws. But courts have said, you know what? Legislators can kind of do reasonable things if they want. And they're not looking at the burdens on lower income voters. The last challenge which I'll focus on is the timing. Some of you may know that the Supreme Court has time and again this year blocked um, successful voting rights uh, litigation because they say it's too close to election to make this change. Um, now there's definitely some, some basis for this. Uh, running elections is very hard. I'll be the first one to say that. Um, a lot of voting rights litigants kind of dismiss that. Um, I, I try not to do that. Um, if anyone is, has ever been a poll worker, for instance, they know it's hard. And, I've, and that's actually a challenge I would issue to all of you. Everyone should be a poll worker. You really don't appreciate the challenges of running an election unless you're a poll worker. There are a lot of rules, complicated rules that the legislatures have created, sometimes on purpose, to make it more difficult to vote. And so they'll say, you know, when you're this close to election, you're introducing new rules, it makes it harder to carry out that election. The problem is that a lot of times litigants don't know that there's a problem in voting until it's close to an election. They might read a news article that says, oh, they're rejecting a bunch of absentee ballots for, because of allegedly mismatched signatures. You don't hear about these problems until they occur. And if you file a lawsuit too early, so for example, the ACLU, after the 2018 elections, we filed a lawsuit right away to make sure the same problems didn't happen in 2020. But our case was dismissed on grounds of ripeness. They said we filed it too early. We don't even know what's going to happen. How can you file a lawsuit? But if you wait until things happen and you file a lawsuit, they say you, you filed it too late. It's too close to an election. So effectively, um, in certain circumstances, it's almost impossible to file a successful lawsuit, especially when you're dealing with voter election administration issues like signature rejections. Now, if you're challenging a statute or regulation, you can, well, you can typically uh, challenge those any time. But uh, with election administration issues, it can be a lot more challenging. So that kind of, uh, oh, and I, I see my time's almost up, but the, that, that kind of, I know I've portrayed kind of a bleak picture of what voter suppression looks like and how it continues to this day. But what I would like to um, leave y'all with, um, and of course I didn't even touch on the problems with voting by mail that we're facing this election and the long lines nor have I touched on the fact that because of COVID, because of COVID, we have um, a lot of people voting by mail and we have postal service issues and we have absentee ballot deadline issues that are being litigated in the courts. Just yesterday, the 11th Circuit blocked a court order that would have extended Georgia's absentee ballot deadline so that people who cast absentee ballots, who mail in absentee ballots on election day, postmark on election day, will still have their ballots thrown out. Um, that's the environment that we're facing. So on that kind of depressing note, um, what are some takeaways I'd like to give to people? Well, I, I want you all to hold two things in your brain at the same time. One, I want you all to be aware of voter suppression. Two, I also want everyone to feel really good about voting. <laughs> um, why do I say this? Especially in this election, we're facing a situation where a lot of people don't feel real good about voting. We're talking about Russian hacking, we're talking about voter suppression, we're talking about all sorts of things. The news media doesn't help because they're, they throw gasoline on the fire. They feed off of people being panicked. And I think a lot of people are probably panicked right now and not unreasonably. And so what happens? People freak out. 
Then what happens? We get on our social media and we freak out. Then other people freak out. And then we read news articles that say, oh my God, this happening, that happening. And then we share them on social media. This is a problem. This can be a major problem. For kind of voter, for people who are like savvy and in the know and who kind of follow this stuff really closely, you know, we're still gonna vote, but we wanna talk about all these issues. The average voter is not paying attention at that level. The, a lot of folks, you know, who, who don't vote all the time don't feel necessarily that great about it. They say, well, what's the point? My vote's gonna count. And then they hear all this talk about hacking and all these things like that. They're like, you know, what's the point? I'm just gonna stay. That is not what we want to happen. The closer we get to the election, the less we need to be inflaming and pouring gasoline on the fire. We need to encourage people to vote. We need to make them feel good about voting. Yes, we are facing barriers, but the way to overcome those barriers, and this is an internal paradox, is by voting. And so that's kind of what I want to be the takeaway. Share, when you go on social media, talk about how you register to vote, talk about how you're voting, encourage people to make a plan to vote, make people feel good about participating in our democracy. Don't just spread the doom and gloom, which um, can exist out there. And so with that, um, welcome to the conference. And uh, I hope you all learn a lot today. Thank you so much, Sean, for that dynamic presentation. We really appreciate all the work you do at the ACLU in the voting rights space. Sean will be back for a question and answer session right after our next presentation. Now we are excited to welcome Professor Pamela Carlin, a Kenneth and Harold Montgomery Professor of Public Interest Law at Stanford Law School. Professor Carlin, we really appreciate you so much for joining us today, all the way from California, where it is 725 on a Saturday. Professor Carlin is one of the nation's leading experts on voting in the political process, and any introduction I give today simply cannot do her justice. So that we can get the most out of our time today, I'm going to turn it over to you, Professor Carlin, and invite you to tell the audience a bit more about yourself and jump into our topic. Well, first of all, thanks so much for having me and thanks for putting on this conference. Uh, voting is important in every election, but perhaps in no election in our lifetimes as important as in this election. What I thought I would do first is talk about three big doctrines uh, at the Supreme Court that are likely to influence both how the Supreme Court decides the cases in front of it and how lower federal courts and even state courts when they're deciding the federal questions will think about it. Then talk about some of the challenges and then talk about the cases, both the cases that the court has already uh, decided in this election cycle, uh, that it's agreed to decide or that it's likely to decide. Uh, and then we'll have time for uh, some questions and answers. So I want to start with the, what I think of as the three big doctrines that are likely to play some role uh, in this election cycle. Uh, the first of them is called the Anderson uh, uh, Burdick uh, Doctrine. Uh, and this is a doctrine about how do we decide whether a particular limitation on voting or a particular barrier uh, to voting uh, is or isn't constitutional under the 14th Amendment. Uh, in the Warren Court era, the Supreme Court applied strict scrutiny to restrictions on the right to vote. So a state's restrictions on the right to vote would be constitutional only if they were really necessary to achieving some compelling government purpose. So the restrictions had to be narrowly tailored. But over the course of the Rehnquist Court into the Roberts Court, the Supreme Court relaxed that standard. And uh, ultimately in uh, the uh, Crawford against Marion County case, which was a case that involved uh, Indiana's very stringent voter ID law, the Supreme Court decided to apply to voting restrictions, something that was known as the Anderson Burdick test, which came from two earlier Supreme Court cases, uh, Anderson against Celebrezzi and Burdick against Takushi. And that uh, case, and that test says that only if a restriction on the right to vote is severe will courts apply really skeptical scrutiny. But as to uh, non-discriminatory 
uh, uh, restrictions on the right to vote that uh, are not severe, the court will uphold them as long as the state has some, uh, some uh, legitimate interest. Uh, and the upshot of this in the, in the Crawford case was that the Supreme Court upheld uh, Indiana's uh, draconian requirement that people have currently valid Indiana issued uh, photo identification in order to cast a ballot uh, on the grounds that uh, you could explain how such a law would prevent in-person voter impersonation fraud, although in fact there had never been an example of that kind of a proven uh, example of that kind of fraud in Indiana's entire hundred plus year history, and because it should uh, increase voter confidence in the system to know that the state was combating fraud, although empirically it turned out that most voters' opinions about their state's uh, level of uh, voter integrity have nothing to do with whether the state has uh, a voter ID law or not. But the backdrop of that is that courts generally uphold barriers to voting as long as those barriers don't seem deliberately discriminatory uh, and you can explain how those barriers are connected to ensuring an orderly, uh, honest election. The second doctrine that I wanted to just identify for you is something that's called the Purcell Principle. Uh, and that doctrine comes from a 2006 case that the Supreme Court decided, uh, Purcell against Gonzalez. And what the Purcell Principle stands for is the idea that we shouldn't be changing, uh, federal courts in particular, shouldn't be changing the rules of the game in the middle of an election. That from the beginning of the election, it should be clear what the rules are uh, and that we stick with those rules, uh, in part because uh, changing the rules leads to voter confusion and in part because it's really hard to change the rules on the run. The third doctrine that I wanna talk about is a doctrine that comes out of the Supreme Court's decision uh, two terms ago in 2019 in the Rucho against Common Cause case. This was a case about political gerrymandering. And what the Supreme Court held in Rucho is that because it could not identify a judicially manageable standard for deciding when uh, gerrymandering has gone too far, uh, federal courts uh, cannot hear political gerrymandering cases because political gerrymanders are a non-justiciable issue. Now that might seem far afield from the things we're gonna be talking about today, but part of the Rucho decision, uh, it bears on, I think importantly, on some of the issues that are arising now. Because one of the things the Supreme Court said in Rucho was that uh, it's not illegitimate for the party that's drawing district lines to take politics into account. That's some level of thinking about the partisan consequences of different election rules is acceptable. Now, the Supreme Court did that in the context of political gerrymandering, which is about how we aggregate votes to determine who wins. But at least two lower courts, uh, judges on two lower courts, have read Rucho to suggest that it's perfectly okay for the party in power to think about the political consequences, even of rules that involve who can vote in the first place. And the most salient example of this comes from the Seventh Circuit, where Circuit Judge Frank Easterbrook, in a case this past summer, said that he did not think that, it, that the district judge had acted properly in um, finding that Wisconsin's decision to reduce the number of early voting hours in Milwaukee was unconstitutional, even if that made it more difficult for voters in Milwaukee to vote, and even if the Republican-dominated legislature had done that for the purpose of disadvantaging Democratic voters. He said that uh, the fact that Democrats had made it easier to vote was presumably because they thought that would help the Democratic Party. And so it was just tit for tat for the Republican Party to make it more difficult for people to vote. So that's the kind of doctrinal landscape that we have going into the questions that come out of this election. And I think the questions that come out of this election, and here I'm gonna build a bit on what Sean was talking about. Uh, 
they arise in a couple of different ways. One is things that are directly linked to COVID itself. So for example, there have been cases challenging states refusals to allow no excuses vote by mail for everyone. Uh, that challenge uh, in Texas has not succeeded uh, and it's unlikely that that, that that challenge will get to the Supreme Court in time for this election this fall. So there are some cases that are directly COVID related in that sense. Then there are cases that are COVID related in the sense that COVID has changed voters' behavior in important ways. And as Sean was alluding to, one of the most important of these is we've had a massive switch towards voting by mail. Uh, in some states, the states are providing everyone with a ballot uh, in the mail. Every registered voter is receiving one. Uh, and the Republican Party is challenging uh, those laws in, in a number of states. In some states, they have expanded dramatically uh, who is eligible to vote by mail. Uh, in some states, uh, they have simply seen as a matter of facts on the ground, many more votes by mail. Uh, and this can lead to several different kinds of litigation. Um, so the kinds of litigation that you're gonna see coming out of this uh, range from questions about what to do if people haven't complied with all the rules around vote by mail. So uh, the, my, my favorite example of this, because the uh, advertisements are so charming, uh, are the naked ballot cases in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, in most states, when you vote by mail, you put your ballot into an interior envelope, which then goes into an exterior envelope that gets mailed. And on the interior envelope, uh, you generally have to, for example, sign so that your signature can be matched against the signature on file. You may have to give other information, the, the last four digits of your social security number uh, or your birth date or something like that. And that's all confidential. It goes inside an envelope that just has the address of uh, the Board of Elections or wherever the ballots are being returned. Um, in Pennsylvania, if you don't put your ballot in the internal envelope, it's what's referred to as a naked ballot and it can't be counted. And so they have these charming ads now of ballots being put into little pairs of ballot underpants and the like to say, you know, don't send in your ballot naked. Um, but in lots of states, there are very different rules about how to do what's called curing a defective ballot. So in some states, the state notifies you when it gets your ballot, if your ballot isn't done properly, and you have to come in and fill out the forms or the like uh, that should have gone along with it or put it into an internal envelope and then hand it back to them uh, or provide identification if you didn't provide the right kind of identification. Um, in other states, uh, there's no obligation for the state to let you know your ballot has gone, has gone, uh, in has become invalid. Uh, and so there's litigation going on about this as well. And the question about, and, and one of the big questions here is litigation about witness requirements. A number of states require you to have a witness, uh, witness you filling out the ballot envelope uh, that your ballot goes into. Um, and there has been litigation about whether that witness requirement should be relaxed. Uh, is it too much of a burden under Anderson verdict? Is it a problem to relax that requirement in the middle of an election uh, under Purcell? And is the failure uh, to relax that requirement an impermissible form of political discrimination uh, or even an impermissible purposeful form of racial discrimination if the state refuses to do that because uh, it thinks there will be more ballots uh, spoiled, cast on behalf of uh, African American or Latino or Native American or Alaska Native voters. Uh, so there's all of that complexity, uh, which is related uh, to COVID uh, uh, in one way or another. Then on top of that, there's litigation uh, that may involve questions about uh, how to deal with the counting of ballots once they come in. So uh, people who vote at the polls vote one of two ways generally. They either just cast a ballot and it goes right into the tabulator, uh, or there's a problem with their ballot and they have to cast what's called a provisional ballot. And here there's a bunch of litigation, including the one case that the Supreme Court has agreed to hear uh, on the merits this year, a case, uh, there, it's a combined set of cases, Republican Party against Democratic National Committee, 
which tells you exactly how political this is. And the other one is called Brnovich against Democratic National Committee. These are cases out of Arizona that have been litigated for quite a while. So they were fully litigated before uh, COVID hit and actually were up in an en banc Ninth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals. Uh, and these cases involve uh, two restrictions that Arizona had placed on ballots. One of them is called out of precinct voting and the other is uh, referred to sometimes as ballot collection and sometimes as ballot harvesting. So uh, Arizona, bar, Arizona um, let me back up a little and say, um, one of the things that can often happen to voters is they go to the polling place that they think is their polling place, but it turns out they've made a mistake about it, either because their polling place has been changed or in some cases, because in voting super centers, many different precincts are voting in the same place, but they vote in different lines. And this leads to something that's sometimes called the right church wrong pew problem, which is people show up to vote and they're eligible to vote, uh, but they've gone to the wrong place. Some states count those ballots for every uh, office for which the voter is eligible to vote, which means, of course, if you think about this upcoming election, uh, you're certainly eligible if you go to the wrong polling place in the state where you're registered to vote for president. You're certainly eligible to vote for governor. You're eligible to vote for senator. Uh, if you go to vote in the correct county, most of the time you'll be eligible to vote for uh, the member of Congress. And you may actually be eligible to vote for almost everybody if you've just gotten slightly wrong on your precinct. So those are what are referred to as out of precinct votes. Uh, some states count those. Arizona did not. Uh, but the um, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals held that Arizona's refusal to count those violated Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act because it had the result of disenfranchising a disproportionate number of uh, Latino voters. Uh, and in addition, Arizona, when it came to people who vote by mail, and the majority of voters in Arizona vote by mail, prohibited anybody other than one of your close relatives from collecting your ballot from you and depositing it in the mailbox or bringing it uh, to the Board of Elections. Uh, and the court held that that restriction, uh, which is sometimes referred to as an anti-ballot collecting uh, restriction or an anti-ballot harvesting restriction, uh, violated the Voting Rights Act, not just because it had a discriminatory result, but because it had a racially discriminatory purpose as well. And uh, on uh, earlier this week, uh, on Thursday, the Supreme Court announced that it would hear that case. Uh, and that may give us a lot of new information, both about how the Supreme Court thinks about Anderson Burdick style arguments, uh, and about how the Supreme Court thinks about the results test of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which is one of the most important protections that we have. On top of that, the Supreme Court has already decided a series of cases in which the Purcell principle seems to have played a major role. The one where the court gave it the most sustained treatment, uh, although all of these cases are on what's called the court's shadow docket. That is not the cases where the court grants review, uh, has full briefing and has oral argument, but cases that the court summarily disposes of on stays and the like. It was a case, again, <laughs> called Republican National Committee against Democratic National Committee. And it involved voting in the Wisconsin presidential uh, primary uh, this past spring where a judge held that because, a, a, a district court judge held that because Wisconsin was so late in getting absentee ballots to people, they would have, uh, uh, the state would not start counting and uh, announcing the results until, af until quite a bit after the election. And it would count any ballot that arrived within that time, regardless of whether the ballot was postmarked by election day. And the Supreme Court held uh, in a summary uh, reversal of that decision to count ballots, regardless of whether the po they were postmarked by election day, as long as they arrived within a week, uh, the Supreme Court struck that down and struck it down on Purcell, Purcell grounds. Since then, we've seen a number of cases where the Supreme Court uh, has refused to allow district court injunctions that would expand the right to vote to go into to go into practice. And almost all of those seem to be based uh, on some version of the Purcell principle. That is that the district court was changing the rules once the election was underway. I think we're gonna continue to see cases like that. Uh, every, literally every other day, somebody goes to the Supreme Court to ask for a stay 
uh, or to ask uh, that a stay that the Court of Appeals has issued be lifted. So that's going to continue on through the election. I want to spend the last couple of minutes that I have with you talking about uh, what we might think of as post-election cases, because all of these cases are about what's the rule that's going to be in, in effect on election day. Uh, some of those cases are going to be about which ballots that are returned by mail get counted. Uh, that will include questions about what to do about ballots uh, that arrive after election day, and that can be quite late after election day. In California, where I am, a ballot that's postmarked by election day uh, will be counted if it arrives as late as 17 days after uh, election day itself. So one of the things I just want to leave you with on this is to understand that uh, it's entirely possible if this election is close, that the results will not be known on election night. Uh, and social scientists who have been looking at this uh, refer to what will happen after that as a combination of potentially a red mirage and a blue wave. The red mirage refers to the fact that a higher percentage of Republican-leaning voters tell pollsters that they plan to vote on election day at the polls. A higher percentage of Democratic voters say they plan to vote by mail. So what that means is in a state, and there are a number of these states, where the ballots that have been cast uh, by mail do not get opened until the polls close, the first election results that are going to be reported from precincts may well be skew uh, heavily Republican, even in Democratic areas. And we know how big this red mirage can be in some sense from the 2018 election, where the Republican candidate for senator in Arizona, for example, was ahead by something like 20,000 votes uh, on election night, but ultimately lost the election once the absentee ballots were counted. And in places where absentee ballots uh, have to be in by election day, those can all be opened and tabulated uh, starting election night. But in jurisdictions that say that they will count any ballot that, are, that has been postmarked by election day, even if it arrives somewhat later, uh, those ballots will not all come in. And if those ballots skew democratic, what you're likely to see is after the red mirage on election night, a blue wave, a building uh, a blue wave of ballots. Um, and so uh, one of the things to keep in mind is it's just going to look different on uh, election on election night than than usual. Then we come to uh, the fact that in places where elections are close, uh, you have first what's often referred to as the recount period. In some states, a candidate is entitled to an automatic recount if the reported margin of victory is below a certain number. And in other states, uh, candidates can litigate to demand a recount. Uh, and you can expect to see that if it would make a difference to the outcome of an election by a well-resourced candidate. So you're almost certain to see that in senatorial races, almost certainly to see that in House races, gubernatorial races, uh, and obviously the presidential race. You may not see that uh, litigation in races for things like school boards or like where the candidates just don't have the resources to hire lawyers and litigate to the hilt. And that litigation can be quite complicated at the presidential level because of a series of other uh, dates that come after that. The first of those dates is in early December, and it's set by something called the Electoral Count Act of 1887. This was one of the issues uh, in Bush against Gore during the 2000 election. And that act says that if a state has certified who its presidential electors are by the um, safe harbor deadline, uh, which this year I think is going to be December 8th, uh, no one in Congress will question who won that state's electors. So states are likely to race to try and get their ballots counted uh, by the safe harbor so they can certify who's the winner. Then on December 14th, the electors meet in each state to cast that state's electoral votes. Uh, and one of the things we know from the Supreme Court's decision this past year in Chiafalo against Washington, is that if the state has a law that compels electors to vote for the candidate they said they would vote for, uh, that law is enforceable. So in states like, for example, Chiafalo is from Washington, where it's actually a misdemeanor for uh, a candidate, uh, an elector not to vote for the proper uh, candidate, uh, they can be forced to do that. Colorado will remove an elector and replace them. 
but there are some states, including some swing states, where there is no law that compels the elector to vote as he or she pledged. Pennsylvania is an example of that. So there may be some litigation over uh, who the proper electors are in a particular state. And I've left uh, open entirely, and we can talk about it in the question and answer period if it's one of the things uh, that interests you, um, a really important issue, which is, will the Supreme Court get involved in any disagreements over who the proper electors are, how the Electoral Count Act works or the like. Uh, and that will turn on uh, questions uh, of federal law and whether the Supreme Court thinks that um, it wants to get involved because none of those laws compel the Supreme Court to grant certiorari the way that the laws that govern, for example, congressional redistricting and state legislative redistricting uh, do. I'll just give one last law that may get litigated either uh, at the district court level uh, or at the Court of Appeals or Supreme Court level. And that's what happens if this election just goes off the rails entirely, uh, either because there's a natural disaster or an emergency in a particular state uh, or the like. Um, there's a provision in the Electoral Count Act that says that if a state fails to choose its elector, electors uh, on the day prescribed, that the, the electors should be appointed in the manner the state legislature directs. Uh, and that may turn out to be a very difficult question. Um, excuse me for just a second. Sit down. Sit down. Um, that may be a very difficult question because, uh, as some of you may know, there have been some suggestions that some state legislatures uh, in swing states uh, where the Republicans dominate the legislature may try to take back uh, the right to appoint the electors if they think that the Democrats are likely to win the popular vote, but they don't trust the results of that process. So we're likely to see uh, a huge amount of litigation. There are already 250 cases pending around the country that involve uh, some rule in this election. Uh, and uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, so I'll stop there uh, so that we have the time that you wanted for uh, me to have, I guess, a discussion with Sean, right? And then uh, to have uh, questions. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Professor Car Carlin, for walking us through a rather complex legal framework around voting rights. We really appreciate that. Um, so yes, we would now like to open the floor to questions. Please type your questions in the Q&A box. If you'd like to direct your question to either Sean or Professor Carlin, please indicate that in your question. And I see that we have one already, so I'll just open that up. Um, okay. Um, from Suman, can the panelists talk about why recent cases line up along partisan lines and what that means for democracy? Why do Republicans want more barriers such as fewer ballot boxes in Texas and Democrats want um, more people to vote? So I think the explanation in part is connected to the demography of the two political parties, that Democratic voters uh, tend to be less wealthy than Republican voters. They tend to be uh, less educated uh, than Republican voters, um, and they tend to be younger. And each of those things is connected with a lower level of political participation. So, um, you know, President Trump sort of said this himself, which is the more voters who vote, the more likely the outcome is to be that the Democrats win any particular election. Uh, and uh, given, given just the partisan skew, um, that explains why the Republican Party right now is a party that wants to restrict voting and the Democratic Party is a party that wants to expand voting. Now, that, now, now historically, uh, the parties have sort of switched sides on this. So if you go back to the 19th century, the Republicans wanted a fuller franchise than the Democrats did um, and the Democrats were the party of vote suppression. So it's not something inherent about the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, it's the interaction of the parties and uh, where their base in the electorate is located. Thank you so much. You. We have, Claire, do you wanna take the next question? Sure. Um, so from Carson, and he's directing this question to Sean. Um, I noticed you used the term vote denial. 
um, and the media tends to use the term voter suppression, is there a technical difference and why do you use denial? So the reason I use denial is uh, because it's been typically used as a legal term um, to describe barriers to the right to vote and typically lawyers and, and some courts use that term. Uh, that's the only reason I, I use it. Voter suppression is not typically a term you use in briefs and by courts, but refers uh, more in layman's terms to the overarching efforts, either intentional or not, to make it harder to vote. And it can also include vote dilution situations where they draw lines to pr primarily hurt people of color and prevent them from electing candidates of their choice. I mean, if I could just add something to that, I think, you know, Sean sort of alluded to this, but vote suppression has the connotation that it is purposeful. That is, that the reason the particular practice was adopted was to diminish the number of voters. And vote denial, uh, as Sean says, can, can come from things that are completely unintentional. Um, that is, you know, things that a government does for good government reasons, but that just have the effect of reducing people's ability to vote. Um, and there are, there are laws that have been around for a long period of time that weren't adopted for the purpose of depressing the vote, but that have that effect because of their interaction with things that have happened since then. So, you know, I don't think any state that had a had a, a, a an absentee ballot law that said, for example, you need to have a witness for the absentee ballot adopted the witness requirement originally to cut down on people's ability to vote. Uh, we have another question from Adam. What might be the legal effect of the disability or death of one of the presidential or congressional candidates? <laughs> so that's a, that's a complicated question in a couple of ways. Um, the, for, for Congress, there's actually a case going on right now, I think it's in Minnesota, where the death of a third party candidate has led to the postponement of the election for that seat. Because under that state's laws, if a candidate dies within the election period, they have to wait for the, the party to nominate a new candidate and then uh, rehold the election. Um, when it comes to anything below the presidential election, it's purely a question of state law what happens. That is, in some states, uh, the votes will be counted for the, the, the party committee in that state of the candidate's party for the candidate who died or, or refuses to run, which is sometimes what happens, um, uh, gets to name a replacement and that replacement will get the votes cast for that party counted for them. In some states, uh, if it's too close to the election, that party is just out of luck uh, because you can't count votes for somebody who's dead. And so the winning candidate will be whichever living candidate receives a majority of the votes. At the presidential level, it's actually really quite complicated. Um, because um, the parties have their own rules on how to replace a candidate who dies. For example, the Republican Party's rule is that the Republican National Committee will, re will name the replacement. So it's not, for example, you know, if in 2000, um, you know, uh, let's say uh, in 2000, George Bush had died, it wouldn't necessarily be Dick Cheney is now the Republican candidate for president in the way that after they're elected and inaugurated, if the president dies, it's automatically the vice president. Um, so the party can name somebody new. And then the question is, in a state that doesn't have a rule on what to do about the electors, it's unclear exactly what happens because the electors are pledged to somebody they can't vote for for president. Um, I think most scholars think that what would happen then is the state would let the electors cast their votes for the party's candidate for the party to which they're pledged. Um, but we don't have we don't have a national contingency plan for something like that. And the only time that a candidate for either president or vice president has died before the electoral votes were cast and counted, it was the losing candidate for vice president. I think it was in 1872. So the answer to that is like so many legal questions and I feel bad for the first years because they've just learned this, but the answer to that question, like the answer to most legal questions is, it depends. 
Great, thank you. Um, so we have a lot of great questions coming in. Thank you, everyone. Keep those coming. Um, are there certain model states in the United States that are conducting voting in a more fair manner? Is our next question. Sean, do you want to take that or? Sure, um, and, and please supplement uh, my answer if you have any. Um, it's a little tough. I, I used to work for the National uh, ACLU Voting Rights Project um, and monitored this stuff a little bit more closely. Um, I'm just going to throw out a few things. Um, I believe Ohio still has a pretty decently lengthy early voting period. Um, I know that uh, I was able to negotiate a settlement with Ohio, which has which expired in 2018, that created that mandated two weeks of early voting hours on evenings and weekends um, across the state, rural or urban. And so, any state that you know, to me, or not all early voting hours are created equal. You need to have evenings and weekends. Um, I also think about states that have had election day registration for a really long time, like Wisconsin and Minnesota. Uh, to me, election day registration is kind of one of the holy grails. If I could wave a wand, I think that might be the reform I, I would do um, because it allows people to show up at the polls, register to vote, and then cast a ballot. Uh, last I checked, uh, well over a dozen states have this already. So I really look to those as a model. Um, and then probably states that don't um, require everyone to show photo identification. They might require um, something like a signature in New York. So for example, in Georgia, if you want to vote absentee ballot, you verify your identity by signing your name. You don't show photo identification. It's the same principle in states like New York, at least last time I checked, you show up, you sign, and that verifies your identity. So those are some states that come off the top of my yeah, and on top of that, I'd add um, states that do automatic voter registration, for example, in California, when you go to the DMV or you go to other government offices, they will automatically register you to vote unless you opt out of uh, registering. Um, states like Oregon, Washington, Utah, uh, for this election, California, uh, Colorado, they send every registered voter a ballot in the mail, and you can return it in the mail if you want. You can put it in a drop box if you want, or you can show up on election day with that ballot and cast that ballot um, at the polling places. I think that's another important uh, option. Um, <coughs> um, you know, some states have much better websites that will tell you where to vote that will allow you, for example, North Carolina has a website that allows you to track your vote by mail ballot. So you can feel assured that your ballot uh, arrived back and was counted. I mean, they'll actually, it'll actually tell you your ballot's gone into the machine and it's been tabulated properly. Um, so there, there, are lots of, there are lots of different ways of having good, good elections, and a lot of states have really good uh, ways of doing this. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from Catherine. How do you see the potential confirmation of Amy Coney Barrett impacting how the Supreme Court might rule on voting rights litigation? Um, She has not decided any voting rights cases or sat on any voting rights cases uh, on the Seventh Circuit. Um, but, you know, to the extent that she says she is uh, an, a follower of Justice Scalia's way of thinking about jurisprudence, Justice Scalia was not, I would say, a pro voting rights justice. Um, he was one of the justices who thought political gerrymandering was non justiciable. Uh, in the vote, Indiana voter ID case, um, the court split three ways. Three of the justices thought the Indiana voter ID law violated the Constitution because it imposed a burden on voters for no reason at all. Three of the justices thought that you couldn't bring a facial challenge to the law uh, because for most voters, it's not a burden to show ID, but that voters who faced a burden would be entitled to bring a constitutional claim. That is, if you found it difficult uh, to get the kind of ID that Indiana wanted. Uh, and that kind of ID is not easy for everyone to get. Um, to get a photo ID in many places, you have to have your birth certificate. And in Indiana, if you were uh, married, you would need both your birth certificate and a copy of your marriage certificate. Because of course, if you got married and changed your name to your spouse's name, your birth certificate wouldn't have your current name on it. And there are lots of elderly people, for example, in the South, 
who were born at home and never got official birth certificates. So, you know, it's hard, I think, for most of us on the phone to realize just how difficult it can be to get a photo ID if you don't already have it in some form. Uh, so three justices thought you could, you could challenge the law as applied to you. Justice Scalia was one of the three justices who thought, as long as this law is fair as applied to, er as applied to most people, you have no claim, no matter how difficult it is for you to get a birth certificate or to get the photo ID. So if her claim that she follows Justice Scalia's jurisprudence um, is uh, valid, is true, then I, I worry about that. And I worry about the vote dilution cases because Justice Scalia uh, suggested several times that he didn't think that the results test of section two of the Voting Rights Act, which says it doesn't matter what intent a state has when it draws district lines, if the result is that minority voters can't elect candidates of their choice, he said he was doubtful about whether that was constitutional. So um, I wouldn't anticipate anything wonderful happening to voting rights jurisprudence if she's confirmed uh, and sits on the court. Thank you, Professor Garland. Okay, so our next question is, why do federal courts recognize a state interest in preventing voter fraud as a justification for creating barriers to vote when there is no actual evidence of fraud? Um, is there another way to make the argument that a state does not have a legitimate reason for creating the barrier? Um, so I'm happy to jump in. Uh, why do federal courts recognize a state uh, interest in preventing voter fraud when there's no actual evidence? That's an excellent question. Um, but uh, the the less cute response is, you know, their their view is that um, theoretically it makes sense to verify someone's identity by requiring them to show photo identification. Again, I'll use the alien analogy. If an alien land on this planet, they would think, oh yeah, that makes sense. And that's all that's required um, un according to several courts. And so they simply haven't required that showing of evidence. They say that's a, uh, an important interest, even if it makes it hard or if, if not impossible for some voters to actually satisfy the requirement. And even if there are other um, legitimate ways uh, or less burdensome ways of verifying identity. And then the second question was, um, I think I lost it, was uh, what, I, I forgot what the second question was. Uh, Sorry, but, is there another way to make the argument that state does not have to, uh, not have legitimate reason for creating the barrier? Um, I think we talk about other ways to satisfy that interest. Uh, but frankly speaking, um, a lot of the litigation that at least I personally have brought um, don't challenge things that are tied to preventing voter fraud. For example, we've challenged the postage stamp requirement for mail-in ballots as a poll tax. And under poll tax case law, there is no government justification ever to require people to pay money and needless to say, a postage stamp doesn't verify your identity. It doesn't prove U.S. citizenship. It doesn't complete a felony sentence. And so, frankly, we bring, I, I brought cases that, that um, challenge you things that aren't related to voter fraud. Thank you, Sean. Um, okay, another question. How impactful would a national holiday for voting be on voter turnout? What are the pros and cons slash why has a national voting day not been instituted already? I'll take a first crack, but I'm interested in, in Sean's thoughts about this as well. So one thing is, I actually think the idea of an election day is something we should abandon for the reasons that he alluded to earlier, which is uh, early voting. It's probably more important to give people more days on which they can vote uh, than to create a national holiday on which some people can vote. But remember, one of the things about national holidays is not everybody gets a national holiday off. Um, a national holiday would give you the day off if you worked for the federal government. Um, but those folks already find it usually pretty easy to vote. Um, and uh, a couple of problems with the national holiday is if you, if you turn it into a national holiday, it may turn out that lots of people are not going to be home on that day. You know, if you make it on a Monday or the like, people will take it as a long weekend. And that may make it harder to get poll workers um, because the poll workers will say, well, this is a holiday. I want to take the holiday as well. Um, 
you know, if, if you're going to have only one election day, you might want to make it the weekend, uh, which is easier for people to vote on. But I actually think what we should be moving towards is election week or election fortnight uh, rather than election day. And then it doesn't need to be a holiday because over a 14 day period, almost every, you know, especially if you do, as Sean was saying earlier, nights and weekends as well, um, that's going to give people a lot more opportunities to cast a ballot and not to have to stand in line for so long because the line standing in some places is itself a, a barrier to voting and just changing the day on which people vote from a work day to a holiday isn't going to do anything to solve that. Um, I'll, I'll nibble at the edges of that question. I think Professor Carlin's answer uh, is really great in, in terms of I had not considered some of those things. So it's really good food for thought. Um, I would point out to folks that in Georgia, and I think in other states, technically speaking, an employer is required to allow someone to take two hours off of work. Um, and I think it has to be paid in order to vote. Uh, but if anyone lives in Georgia and Atlanta, y'all know two hours is not enough time. And then obviously because of the long lines. And so uh, that's one response. A second response, and this is really just nibbling at the edges here. Um, in Georgia, a lot of school, public schools host polling places. Um, and recently there have been concerns about random adults going into school on Tuesday to cast a ballot. Uh, one small benefit of a, you know, at least a county holiday or a municipal holiday is that students would be off that day. And so people can use those uh, places polling sites because there are not always a lot of available polling sites. But it then raises the concerns that Professor Carlin mentioned about people leaving town. And um, the, the last thing I will say is, um, Actually, no, the thought escaped my mind, so I'll just leave it at that. Thank you both. Our next question is, do you see any realistic path to online or digital voting from home? And from your perspective, would this be positive or negative for voting rights? Um, I'll, I'll artificially respond to this one first. Um, Not now, but I'm not a futurist and I don't know uh, if there's a way to do in the future. I'm sure before the telephone was invented, people couldn't think of how to communicate in real time. So that's my kind of cop out answer. Um, would it be positive or negative is kind of a similar response. Um, you know, I, I will just pivot and I'll, I'll dodge the question by pivoting to the fact that a lot of people don't have internet access, especially in rural areas. And uh, you know, in, in Georgia, we have online voter registration and now you can apply for absentee ballot applications online, which is wonderful. I fully support that. The problem is that a lot of these online situations, they, they verify identity by requiring a signature. And since, well, now you can't, but since you don't sign a name um, on, on the screen, what they do is they take your signature from the DMV database, most typically, and then they use that to verify identity. So what you do is you enter your driver's license or state ID number, and then that is the verification process online. Again, not everyone has an ID or a DMV number. And so um, I believe last time I checked, California is the only one that lets you put in a social security numbers to be able to do that. But everywhere else, um, you have to have an ID. So you not only have to have an ID, you also have to have internet access. So yes, let's make it easier for people to vote, but let's not forget the people who really need it the most. And I think on top of that, two things are, you know, until we've solved a lot of the security issues, um, I think people worry about online voting um, for security reasons. Uh, and they also worry about online voting for a, a, a reason that has to do with the fact that if, every, if, if, you, if you're telling people to vote online, they can be influenced or coerced in various ways that can't be, that can't be monitored. And we did a study of um, voting in long-term care facilities in Philadelphia a while back. Um, and it turned out in some of the long-term care facilities that the director of kind of programming would just bring everybody into the same room and have them all cast their ballots together. 
would request absentee ballots for all the people and, and, and cast them together. And the worry there is not a worry so much about fraud that somebody else is going to cast your ballot, but a little bit about um, coercion. And so you need, to be, you need to be cognizant of those issues. The other thing, which is not a reason not to go, not to move to making it much easier for people to vote, because I think we should be making it much easier. There was a really interesting article, this is now, I don't know, 20 years ago or so, um, by uh, Rick Vallely, who's a professor of political science at, um, at Swarthmore. It was called Voting Alone. Uh, and it was a takeoff on the Robert Putnam book, Bowling Alone, which is about the kind of decline of civil and civic organizations in the United States. As lots of people now belong to online organizations, but they no longer belong to the local PTA or the League of Women Voters or other groups that get together in their community. And he said, if, if people start thinking of voting as just another thing they do, like in the same way that they buy stuff from Amazon or the like, it changes how people think about the vote they're casting. Um, it changes it so that people no longer think of it as a civic duty, they think of it as another consumer activity. Um, and so one of the questions is how you continue to have people think about voting as something they're doing where they think about the public good uh, and the importance of voting for candidates who will serve the public interest. Um, again, I think that's outweighed to, some ex to, to an important extent by making it easier for people to vote. So if people find it easier to vote from home, um, we shouldn't cut down on that on the grounds that making them stand in line at a polling place on election day concentrates their minds. Um, but it is something to think about in how we as a society talk about voting. That is, I think we have to be much more conscious of talking about voting as exercising a civic responsibility um, in a time where the way people vote doesn't signal that as powerfully. Um, actually, I now remember the point I had forgotten. I'm just going to shoehorn my response, even though this has nothing to do with the question I was being asked. The point I wanted to make, actually, and I should have made this at the, at the opening keynote, was um, we need to encourage people to vote now. No, I mean, if it's possible to vote now. In Georgia, that's by casting an absolute ballot. And we need to encourage people to put them in a drop box and not rely on the mail system. When early voting starts, and I like to actually to piggyback off of uh, President Collins' point, some people like to say October 12th is election day in, uh, in Georgia. And we need people to cast ballots early in person as soon as possible to reduce the long lines that people face on election day and even during the early voting period. So what I wanna exhort everyone to do is to go out and tell people to vote on October 12th, or at least that week. And if they're voting by absentee, they need to have mailed it in yesterday. And so that was kind of the uh, most important takeaway I wanted to leave people with. Yeah, can I piggyback off something that yeah. you just said, which it was something I didn't, I didn't talk about in my opening remarks, but is, is important, to, important to understand, which is in-person voting this time around is gonna feel different in a number of ways for people. And so, Part of what Sean is talking about is let's reduce the surge, if you will, of voters on election day. Um, but one of the things just to keep in mind is if people are standing at social distance from each other in the lines, the lines are gonna look a lot longer than they usually look. Uh, because usually you're standing you know, a foot and a half away from the person in front of you. And if now you're standing six or eight feet away from that person, the line is gonna look a lot longer. Um, it, they're gonna have to disinfect the pens or the voting booths in between people, and that's gonna take longer and the like as well. And so that's one of the reasons it's really important for people who can vote early to vote early so that those people who have to go on election day will not face uh, the delays that they would face if everybody showed up on election day itself. And the poll workers, I mean, I don't know if you've talked about this before I came on, because I came on about halfway through your keynote, Sean, but. Um, you know, a huge percentage of poll workers in the United States are over the age of 60. And those people are not going to want to be poll workers, even with PPE this time around. So did you talk about power of the polls or anything? No, but I was going to, I am now going to use that as an excuse to promote a poll worker recruitment program that ACLU Georgia was doing. But, but no, please go on. No, no. I, 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 so powerofthepolls.org is a national organization that will help you figure out if you can be a poll worker in the place where you're located. Um, and uh, so that's something that people should, you know, those of you who are law students or the like, I don't know whether uh, Emory has decided to do this, but Stanford has canceled 
uh, Stanford Law School canceled classes on election day so that students who can be poll workers, because a lot of our students are remote now, and so they're actually where they're registered to vote, or who want to do election protection uh, hotline work or the like can do that. Um, but Power of the Polls is the national organization. Sean, you were going to say about folks in Georgia. Yeah, um, I really wanted to um, shamelessly plug ACLU of Georgia's poll worker recruitment program. Um, it has gotten notice from folks outside of Georgia, and it's been very effective. And I would urge everyone on this call to consider and then apply to be a poll worker. Um, election monitoring is very important, but poll workers are on the front lines, and a lot of voter disenfranchisement happens completely under the radar, and we don't hear about it until afterwards. Um, like Professor Carlin said, a lot of poll workers are elderly and at risk of COVID. So our poll worker recruitment program really focuses on um, people who are tech savvy, who aren't at risk and younger, and people who are attorneys. Um, we in, in Georgia, unfortunately, you have to live in the county where you are a poll worker. Um, we were unsuccessful in getting that uh, regulation abolished. Um, right now, we're we're good on Fulton and DeKalb, but Gwinnett and Cobb, we need people who are living there to become poll workers. If you just Google ACLU of Georgia poll worker recruitment program, there's a sign up sheet. Um, but even if you do live in Fulton and DeKalb, sign up because a lot of poll workers, unfortunately, um, they drop out. And so then they need an emergency person. So for instance, um, in the August runoff, um, I, they were, unable, they were unable to train me because they didn't expect me to have to poll work, but then there was an emergency and they called, came in, gave me a call 24 hours in advance that we need to work the polls tomorrow. So I showed up, I did it, and I, I wanna be really careful on how I say this. Being poll worker is not easy, but it was not extraordinarily difficult for me to figure out the poll pad and how to check voters in. Um, it's kind of like being a cashier. Once you do it a few times, you're pretty fast. And I was able to pick up on it pretty quickly. And so we need folks who are recently tech savvy um, and really encourage y'all to, to get out there. Thank you both so much for telling our attendees how they can get involved um, in the next couple of weeks. So it looks like we have time for about one or two more questions. Um, this next question is, do you believe there will ever be a consistent set of voting rules across the states from any of these Supreme Court cases or from a new statute? Uh, yes, yes, I do believe that we will end up with some, with more consistency across the states than we now have. Um, uh, in, the, in the current Congress, the House of Representatives had introduced a bill called HR1 that would dramatically increase, uh, the, dramatically increase the standardization of voting uh, for federal elections. And by federal elections, that includes any election where a federal candidate is on the ballot, regardless of whether there are also state candidates on the ballot. So in most states, that means for all elections, uh, essentially. Um, and it would have created requirements for automatic voter registration. It would have eliminated um, disenfranchisement of individuals convicted of a crime unless they were currently incarcerated. Uh, it would uh, require uh, states to uh, allow more vote by mail and the like. Um, so if we have the political will, yes, I would anticipate we get a law that is uh, both more expansive of voting rights and more standardized across the country. And, and just a real quick constitutional point, uh, generally speaking, Congress does have the power to set voting rules uh, for federal elections. Uh, well, not generally speaking, absolutely speaking, um, to the extent it doesn't violate um, some other constitutional provision. Uh, and Congress can pass laws such as the Voting Rights Act that do regulate state elections um, if it's pursuant to a constitutional grant of power like the um, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Uh, but because most states completely understandably are not going to create two different systems for federal and state, whatever federal requirements are imposed by Congress, generally speaking, they will also apply to the state. Great, thank you. So I'm going to ask you all one more question um, and then we will close out your session. So this question is, the Seventh Circuit recently rejected Wisconsin legislators' challenge to the extension of the absentee postmark deadline and asked for the Wisconsin Supreme Court to weigh in. 
What do you think the most likely outcome is? Can you compare that case with the 11th Circuit's recent decision on the same issue? And I'm happy to repeat any of that. I know that was several. No, I think, I think I got it. Um, the Wisconsin Supreme Court is a very partisan court and it's currently dominated by Republican appointees. Um, so, you know, I would expect that, you know, they are likely to rule in favor of Republican challengers to that, but I, I don't have any inside information or anything about that. Yeah, I don't really have much to much to add. Um, I've read the cases, but I've not studied them super closely and um, very recently. So um, I really don't have much to add there. Great, thank you both so much for being here with us this morning. It was a great way to open the conference. Um, and we're just so grateful to have you share your expertise with us and to tell our attendees how you could get involved. Um, I learned a lot and I'm sure everyone else did also. Well, thanks um, for having us. Thank you. Um, so just a few things before we transition to the next session. I just sent the next link in the chat for everyone. Um, and I'm going to give you a quick preview of the next session, our panelists. So this is who we're expecting for session two, and it's going to be a great panel. Um, so we look forward to seeing all of you then. It is now 1111, and we will start promptly at 1120, um, if everyone could join then. So thank you again to Professor Carlin and Sean. And just a reminder, you'll have to end this session and proceed to the next link. <laughs>